I now call the March 9th meeting of the Wallingford Swarthmore School Board to order. Uh, this evening, uh, Jerry Ballas is unable to participate tonight, so we have eight voting uh, board members present this evening. Um, in the opening, as you're willing and able, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, so first, we usually start with the student representative's report, but I'm gonna just ask you to wait just one minute. I wanted to open our meeting tonight with a few comments before we move to the student report. Um, over the past week, uh, our school district families and community have been wrestling with some challenging issues. And some of you have been touch, in touch with the board uh, through email and other communications about coronavirus, field trips, sleep and school start times, and what we're doing as a district around diversity and inclusion, among other issues. And I wanna make sure everyone knows that we receive your messages and read each and every one of them. Um, certainly, um, you know, today stands out in particular, the coronavirus outbreak has been occupying the minds of many recently. Um, I work in healthcare, it's certainly occupying many of our minds and it has many people on edge. Um, it's a rapidly evolving situation and the district is following it closely. Um, several districts in the region have already been forced to close this week due to contact with cases. We are going to spend some time talking about this issue later this evening, particularly as it relates to some domestic and international trips for our students, uh, and so that'll come during new business this evening. Um, and as I mentioned, the board has also received email and communications <laughs> regarding um, some issues around diversity and inclusion, and how can, how can we ensure that we foster an open, welcoming, supportive environment for all students. And this came about from recent discussions at SRS about the diversity of books available for students in our classrooms and decisions and processes about how books are selected. And I think we'll certainly have some members of our district community here this evening that wish to speak to this issue. And I just wanna say we welcome your comments. However, I also wanna take this time uh, to just pause for a moment and speak to the issues of diversity and inclusion. And I think one of the highest priorities for any school and our schools in particular must be making sure that every single student feels valued, respected, and welcomed. The community we create in our schools is critical to education and development as children grow into young adults. And these are important values that we must uphold in all aspects of our lives and in our schools. And I hope that what can come from this recent discussion is a strong commitment by the district to seeing that these values are translated throughout our schools. I look forward to hearing from those that wish to comment this evening. And I can tell you that I do know the administration is looking at this issue to make sure we have procedures in place that support these goals. And you can expect to hear more about this as a focus topic at one of our upcoming meetings. Um, so thank you. Um, at this point, I want to move on to our student representative's report. Um, I do want to point out that our student representative, Sama, um, just qualified for nationals in speech and debate. So congratulations, Sama. <laughs> So she didn't know I was gonna do that, so she might be embarrassed, <laughs> but um, let's have the student report. Thank you. Members of the Sleep in School Start Times Task Force will host a community town hall meeting this Wednesday, March 11th at 6.30 p.m. in the high school auditorium. The event will be an opportunity to provide community members with an update on the Sleep in School Start Times investigation and for community members to provide feedback regarding the proposed plans. Everyone is encouraged to attend. Tomorrow, Tuesday, March 10th, the SRS Diversity and Inclusion Group will meet at 5.30 p.m. in the SRS Library. SRS community members, including family, teachers, and staff, will meet to discuss ways to make the school more inclusive and welcoming for its diverse student body. Fourth grade students at SRS are visiting Harrisburg next Thursday, March 19th, to tour the Capitol and learn about the state's government. And finally, SRS will host International Night on Thursday, March 19th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. This biannual event is open to all SRS students and their families. International Night is an opportunity to teach SRS about the many cultures that make our community so special. If you want to host a table for your country or region or perform a song or dance, sign up by this Friday. NPE's Read Across America Night last week was a wild success with around 663 students, parents, and teachers participating. The event was followed by a Read Across America Day in school, where students swore a reader's oath in the morning, listened to mystery readers, and read throughout the day. 
Finally, this year's NPE's Got Talent is taking place this upcoming Wednesday, March 11th at 9 a.m., followed by a 6 p.m. performance for family and friends. There will be fantastic dancers, outstanding musicians, great singers, comedians, and more. On Tuesday, March 17th, West will have its annual Go for the Greens event during lunch to encourage healthy eating. On Thursday, March 19th, fourth graders at West will visit the Brandywine Museum of Art to observe and appreciate local artists. And finally, on Friday, March 20th, students at West will put on their annual talent show. Strathaven Middle School is the winner of the 2018 to 2019 STEM Scholars Program and Capetition Recycling Competition. Executives from the Philadelphia Eagles and Braxchem, the largest polyolefins producer in the Americas and leading producer of biopolymers in the world, will award a $2,500 check to Strathaven Middle School on Thursday, March 12th during an all-school afternoon assembly. The middle school would like to thank faculty advisor Ms. Caitlin Locke for her awesome leadership. And at the high school last week, we held our annual blood drive. All together with the hard work of volunteers from student council, the safety team, the Red Cross, and of course the donors, we collected 121 pints of blood, enough to help 363 people. Yesterday was the last production of the musical Chicago. The cast left the audience feeling razzle-dazzled with their spectacular singing and dancing. And finally, in an unfortunate turn of events, the French exchange trip has been canceled. French students were supposed to visit their exchange students in France over spring break, but the school deemed the trip too risky. While the students were not reimbursed for their plane tickets, they will receive vouchers from the French travel company to tour France another time. And on the bright side, French Club will be still be visiting the restaurant Marrakesh in the city next Thursday, March 19th, Istanbul, Moroccan cuisine. Thank you. Thank you, Sama. Um, that takes us uh, to the superintendent's report, Dr. Palmer. Thank you, Dr. Grandy. And I'm actually so happy there are people in the audience tonight because you would have gotten my email yesterday giving you updated information on the coronavirus. In that email, I indicated that all of the superintendents were briefed uh, by a group of individuals from Delaware County Council, Delaware County Emergency Management, the Office of Intercommunity Health, and we um, received our first collective briefing. Well, let me report. We had our second briefing today. We all gathered again. And in that particular meeting, we had um, the Delaware County Medical Advisor, um, Tim Boyce, who was leading the Delaware County effort, Dr. Taylor from County Council, or County Council, Lori Devlin from the Intercommunity Health Office, and then Kristen Faust from the PA Department of Health. Almost all of the superintendents were there, and we brought individuals who are also on our safety teams with us to be fully briefed. In that meeting, we received a report from the Department of Health, not more specifics than what you're reading in the newspaper or seeing on the news now, but she did give us an update. We also received guidance to stay open. There was no cause for concern to close schools at this moment, and, and I say at this moment because the situation is unfolding every day and with every new um, briefing that we get and also for all of us to be vigilant and focus on those items that I put in the e-blast to everyone to avoid the close contact, to make sure we wash our hands often, clean and disinfect, keep our distance, and most importantly for us as adults or for our children, if we are sick, to stay home. They reiterated those items to us. And then we also talked as a county talking about that if there is something that affects one school district, it will very much likely affect all of the school districts in the county. So one of the things that we are going to do is um, very shortly collaborate on a pandemic plan for the county that would include the county officials as well as all of the school district superintendents. I anticipate having that available to our parents very quickly. The other piece that we are doing, we left the meeting as a group of superintendents saying that we were going to all go back to our districts, assess our own readiness level, and then come back with our plans by Monday at the latest so that we all would know what every other school district is doing in the event we do have an emergency. The bottom line of what we were doing was agreeing to commit as a group that we would plan together. And the planning is so critical because it's not just what we do in the schools. It's what the emergency officials do for all of us. They were talking about having that continuity of government plan. We are one of the recipients of that. So we have to work in um, collaboration with all of the partners. Let me also take a moment to talk about the collaboration that we have with the Department of Health. 
And I do get questions, and I know the board has gotten some questions about what do we do if we think we have exposure or we think we have a risk that we should be concerned about. And a risk could be an employee may have had contact with someone. Someone may be traveling from another country and coming back into the United States. Someone may be a friend of someone who knows someone else who may be exposed. Whenever we're aware of a situation, whether it involves an employee or a student, we are in regular contact with the Department of Health. I can't tell you the amount of times that I or I and Gina Ross, who is our Director of Student Services, has been in contact with the Department of Health. We don't leave anything up to chance. We don't guess if a person should be here. We check with the Department of Health. And that involves our students who may be traveling or any of our employees um, if they are in contact with anyone or traveling. So I want to assure everybody we do take the time to speak with the Department of Health on any one of those items. And as I'm saying, we are talking with them frequently. Um, one of the uh, main pieces that they did talk about in our meeting today is that every one of the contacts that they are talking about in Pennsylvania are through direct contact. It isn't a situation where we have community spread. And that was one of the most important things that they said, because if we are at community spread, that could be what some would say is a game changer. That really does change how we look about uh, the coronavirus. But at this point, there has been that direct contact. That could change five minutes from now. I stay tuned to any of those briefings like you all do. But know that when the Department of Health or Emergency Services does want to speak with us, we know we will get a request to jump on a phone call or to go there in person, which is what we did today. And we as a group of superintendents are staying in contact very regularly. So know that as I get more information, I remain committed to sending the information out to parents. So you got the one briefing yesterday. I'm giving the update now. And as I get the um, release from Tim Boyce, I will send that to families as well. So you can expect ongoing updates on this topic. And Dr. Grandy, I don't know if you have any questions on anything I didn't cover, but I was trying to look through all my notes to see if I covered everything that I think we've been contacted yeah. about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Thank you. And so as I mentioned, um, you know, we will have a discussion item during new business uh, about this topic a little further. And we're hoping to actually um, have um, a public health expert also join us remotely if we can make all the technology work. Um, so that takes us to um, uh, board announcements. Um, the board did meet prior to this meeting this evening in executive, executive session to discuss negotiations, personnel, and a safety and security issue. Um, so that takes us to our focus topic for this evening. And tonight we do have one focus topic, which is an update on the sleep in school start time study. And before I have Dr. Palmer introduce that, um, I just want to um, take this moment to thank the administration because I know this has been a tremendous amount of work to look into this issue. And this is something that the board did charge the administration uh, with doing is undertaking this study. So we appreciate that. So let me let Dr. Palmer introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Grandy. I see, I see Mr. Crawl at the podium, and let me introduce him. Steve Crawl is our assistant principal at the middle school, and he has taken over the facilitation of this board goal from Dr. Citarelli Jones. And Steve, my compliments to you. It has been a very smooth handoff between Dr. Jones and yourself. This evening, know that we are on the next leg of our investigation of the sleep and school start times goal that we have. We have done a lot of preliminary work at this point, and I sent you yet another email over the weekend so that you would have information with talking about where we are in our review of this topic, knowing that we will have a comprehensive report to the school board so that they can be fully informed of what are all of the issues associated with this uh, particular topic before they would ever consider taking action. Uh, this evening is a critical part in our process to getting that report to the board. We are at the development stage of where we have some ideas that we've presented to the community and we are genuinely looking for feedback. We've asked if you have feedback, send it to us in writing, talk to us, and uh, consider coming to the town hall listening event. But tonight is an opportunity for Steve 
to update us on the progress, where we started, how we got to where we are right now, to where I sent you the information over the weekend, and what are our next steps. One of the reasons that we did this tonight, in addition to having the town hall event, I wanted to make sure we had as much opportunity to have the information put out to our families so that we could elicit feedback. This evening, we're taping our presentation. We'll have it on our website. So anybody who can't be here tonight or isn't watching at home can see it. People can review it. We'll have the PowerPoint up there, but we will have the full video. And we are going to do our best to videotape the town hall as well so that people, if they cannot make it, will be able to still get the same message. Steve, you can take it away. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Good evening to the school board, board president, Dr. Grandy, superintendent, Dr. Palmer, and to the greater Wallingford Swarthmore community. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Thank you for allowing me to take some time this evening to provide an update to the community on the process and progress that the WSSD school start times committees have made to date. However, before we jump right into where we are now with our progress, I want to take a few minutes to refresh the community why we are here. It is simply a fact that sleep and school start times for students have been gaining more national and local attention. There is considerable research that supports the idea of moving start times later for secondary students in an effort to better support their mental and physical health. Natural changes in the body beginning with the onset of puberty Set in, moments, set in motion some disruption to, this, to the natural sleep cycles that teens experience when compared with that of younger children, and adults for that matter. The timing and delay in the release of the hormone melatonin is one concrete example of how and why peak wakefulness lasts longer and why secondary students often don't fall asleep until late in the evening. And this is also why this disruption in their daily circadian rhythms or their sleep-wake cycles is not simply corrected by trying to catch up by sleeping in on the weekends or napping here and there. For reference, these statistics were taken directly from our own student survey administered in the fall of 2019 to 8th through 12th graders. Of the 1,150 students that responded, you can see that 46% reported going to bed at 8, 11 p.m. or later. 61% of students surveyed, they felt that they usually get too little sleep, and 53% of students surveyed said they feel tired during the day for several days a week. And the understanding that this is an important issue for adolescents in now and has been recognized by medical and health organizations, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Sleep Foundation. And even though this is becoming a more well-known problem, it is still reported that most teen students are getting less than seven hours of sleep per night regularly. Okay. Well, the slides will catch up. The Joint State Government Commission report on sleep deprivation in adolescence was published in October of 2019. This report included the advisory committee's recommendations, the most important being noted that districts should give consideration to later start times to secondary schools. Further recommendations <clears throat> included gathering robust data and making evidence-based solutions as well as making sleep health literacy a component of the school health curriculum. Oh, you know what happened? It's on, did no, it all freeze up there? Okay, okay. gotcha. And that brings us to Wallingford Swarthmore. In May of 2019, at the school board's request, the district embarked on investigating, so we're net one slide further, you're almost there, you got it. Good job, teamwork. <laughs> the district embarked on investigating and exploring what later school start times could look like in Wallingford Swarthmore. Several district and school-based committees were formed with over 50 contributors, including students, parents, staff, and school administrators. We reached out to other local districts to use as a resource, hosting a panel event with members from the Radnor School District, and we brought in Dr. Wendy Troxell, a renowned behavioral psychologist with an emphasis on sleep studies, to present to our community. The broad-based approach of this investigation is supported by some of the numbers that you see before you. Four committees were created to conduct research, analyze logistical data, 
to evaluate the feasibility of scheduling and start time scenarios. Eight presentations were given, including community engagement events, school board updates, and those delivered to faculty and students. Over, over 50 contributors provided input and feedback to our committees, and over 90 transportation scenarios were analyzed and vetted by our transportation group members. Through the collaboration of work and, of, and work of those committees, a list of priorities for the district was established, such as maintaining the high school block schedule, minimizing lost instructional minutes for student athletes, striving to keep activity bus runs for middle and high school students, and moving the start time to as close to the recommended time of 8.30 as possible. Understandably so, we need to meet our state mandated instructional minutes. And the district also prioritized the pre preservation of the quality of our music program by trying to keep a minimum number of minutes for practice. The high school scheduling think tank began exploring potential school start time and schedule changes with 46 ideas initially emerging. When these 46 ideas were further analyzed for transportation needs and for meeting the necessary daily instructional minutes, unfortunately, all of them had to be eliminated as either the increases in busing were too significant to consider or they did not meet the required instructional minutes. Towards the end of 2019, it became clear that the district needed to pivot and start with a new approach, which was, shi which was shifted by looking at potential start time transportation scenarios first. Basically, transportation was the key cog in all of this. The district contracted with TransFinder to independently determine the number of buses needed for number of scenarios. An in-depth report of over 200 pages of analysis providing 47 new TransFinder created busing schedules was provided to the district. And it allowed Wallingford Swarthmore to vet them for busing costs, instructional minutes, and the time in between the bus runs to create our school-based schedules in each of our schools. It was at this point in the process that the realization of changing high school start times without affecting other school start times was going to, be, going to be next to impossible unless no budgetary constraints existed, which they do. <laughs> By the end of January 2020, only four of the 47 TransFinder created schedules were remaining, with all of the others being eliminated for similar reasons as stated earlier. School-based scheduling think tanks at every level in the district began to look at the four remaining ideas. This step in the process coincided with the last school board subcommittee update after further verifications of bus runs by TransFinder and our own district transportation department, two of the remaining four ideas also were eliminated as they added either a total of seven or nine more buses than our current total fleet of 35. One of the remaining now two ideas was tweaked slightly by 15 minutes to allow for a current total of three remaining ideas, three remaining start time ideas, originally coined terms ideas A, B, and C. <laughs> These current three ideas had each of their TransFinder transportation projections verified again by our own WSSD transportation department they were then presented to the sleep and school, ta school start time task force on February 25th, starting the process of gathering community feedback. Hmm. Freezing up again, it's okay. So if you have the handout in front of you, if you find the part that says feedback, the next slide actually takes a lot of that same information. So if this isn't working, you can kind of reference that as I'm speaking. The process of gathering feedback is an important one, as each time we consider or encounter this step, new questions arise. Some of the most common topics that feedback questions and comments have been related to were to be projected on the slide, but you can find them in your handout. From the parents and community, we have heard questions about the possible ripple effect that could now touch elementary and middle school start times, an impact on the participation in school-based music and athletics, an impact on the alignment of dual enrollment programs, such as the vocational school, and quite frankly, the impact on the budget and tax increases. Students have reported questions and feedback related to concerns about having enough time late in the day for other commitments and homework, 
athletes missing classes, and the logistical issue of getting to school if no one was home to drive them if they missed the bus, which to which I would say you have to get up earlier. <laughs> <clears throat> Teacher feedback varied from emphasizing the value of the block schedule, student athletes missing instructional time, and the effects on their own workday schedules and the impact on their families and commitments outside of school. The process of continuing to gather feedback and community and stakeholder feedback will be an important one to our process of completing the most comprehensive report to the board by the end of April. Our next formal opportunity will be on Wednesday, March 11th at 6.30 p.m. at Strathaven High School where we will host a community town hall event and listening sessions for the dual purposes of informing the community and gathering feedback from stakeholders. Here is a quick look at our current start and end times, noting the length of the day and the number of buses required to transport our district students using these times. Please note that the length of the school day is not equivalent to the mandated instructional minutes, as that is reliant on the internal building schedules and pro programming of specific schools. We currently have the need for 35 buses in our fleet. For those who are not aware, the high school runs on the block schedule with four 80-minute classes per day. Fifth block, which runs from 2.05 to 3.05, is after the school day. And it is a unique time that our high school students have to attend clubs, seek extra help, and to participate in the music program for which they actually receive high school credit. This opportunity allows students to fulfill fine arts credits after the school day is over, freeing up blocks of scheduled time for other classes, electives, and other academic, academic opportunities in future years. The middle school, similarly to the elementary schools, runs music programs before the start of the school day. The middle school academic day begins at 750 and concludes at 2.30 with extra help clubs and afternoon music ensembles beginning at 2.35, some music programs beginning as early as 2.20 in the advisory period connections. At 3.05, athletic practices begin allowing middle school students to practice until five o'clock, until the five o'clock bus picks them up. The high school day begins at 7.35 and ends at 2.05 with fifth block options including extra help, clubs, and the credit earning music program. The majority of athletic practice start around 315 and allow the high school athletes to also ride the five o'clock bus. Next up is idea A, which does achieve the 830 start time for the high school. The high school fifth block now runs from 305 and ends at 415. It's down here at the bottom at which time the majority of athletic practices would begin. Idea A has a small impact on the elementary start and end times as they start 15 minutes later at nine o'clock and end 10 minutes later at 340. We do not anticipate a major change in music and activities at the elementary level with this scenario as a nine o'clock time would still allow for these activities to take place before school. In this scenario, the middle school schedule remains untouched with little to no anticipated effect on activities and athletics. Idea A requires an anticipated increase of three buses, bringing a total number of buses needed to 38. On this graphic, you can see that the 8.30 start time for the high school, the academic day ending at 3.05, and fifth block running from 310 until 415, an estimated 310 once they walk to get there. Some five minutes of transition. At 415, al allowing athletic, athletic practice to begin at 415, at, so, I'm sorry, at 425, allowing 10 minutes for transition from the end of fifth block to athletics. And that's the same practice as we do now, a 10 minute gap from them to get to athletic practices. If we were to keep the framework of our high school day similar to what it is now, which we would have for this scenario, this would indicate that the PM buses to pick up students would run at 3.05 at the high school, 4.15 after fifth block, and 6.30 for student athletes.
Steve, this is unusual that it's freezing up. I don't think in any board presentation I've seen that it has frozen even once, but now must, it's freezing. Right, oh, I don't know. Right. There we go, ready? Uh, it's still, still frozen. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, Alex. Well, it's given time for people to process <laughs> what, what they're hearing. All right, idea B, here we go, okay. Idea B is quite different. The proposed start and end times of all three schools are changed, with the elementary day running from 7.30 a.m. to 2.15 p.m. The high school is able to achieve an 8.15 start time, ending their day at 2.45, with fifth block ending at 3.45. The middle school starts at 8.40, <clears throat> 50 minutes later than the current start time, and the academic day ends at 3.20. Idea B requires an anticipated increase of four buses, bringing the, to the total now to 39. The day in the life scenario of one middle school student now has the academic day starting at 8.40, meaning the old start time of 7.50 is now when before school music programs would begin instead of 7 a.m. The academic school day ends at 2.30 for the middle school with music ensembles, extra help, clubs and athletic practices now beginning concurrently at 325. This is a significant change for the availability of options for middle school students for after school. What should similarly be noted is that with the elementary school date now starting at 7.30 a.m. here, before school activities such as music, clubs, and meetings would now be moved to the after school time. A high school student's academic day now begins at 8.15, ending the school day at 2.45. Fifth block options such as clubs, extra help, and music begin at 2.50 and run until 3.45. Ten minutes later, athletic practices be begin, finishing in time for student athletes to catch the 6 o'clock bus, which is an hour later than where it is now. Idea C is a slight variation of the previous idea B, but pushing everything back by another 15 minutes to accommodate the high school with the ideal 8.30 start time as recommended by health organizations. The elementary school day would start at 7.45 and end at 2.30, an hour earlier than the current start and end times. This scenario play plays similarly as idea B with regards to the elementary times as well, with a 7.45 start time before school activities like music clubs and staff meetings would need to be moved to the to after the academic after the academic school day which ends at 2:30 the middle school day would run from 8:55 to 3:35 an hour and 5 minutes later than the current start and end times and the high school achieves the 8:30 start and the 3 o'clock end time with fifth block running until 4:05 because of the times of day and other out of district bus runs, idea C requires an anticipated increase of five buses, bringing the total in the fleet needed to 40. Middle school students participating in before school music would need to be at morning practices by 8.05, 50 minutes before the school day starts at 8.55. At 3.35 when the school day ends, students would head to their after school music, seek extra help with teachers, go to their clubs and athletic practices, which like idea B are now all running concurrently. The high school day begins at 8.30, ending the academic day at three o'clock, with fifth block running from 3.05 to 4.05 for music, clubs, and extra help. Athletic practices will begin at 4.15, making the late bus run arrive at 6.20 to pick up student athletes to transport them home. The process moving forward. We plan to present our findings in a comprehensive report to the school board at the April 27th school board meeting. Right now, and as mentioned before, we are now in full listening mode, gathering input and feedback from the community. We will continue to investigate the impacts on athletic, music, and activities programs, alignment with dual enrollment programs such as the vocational school, 
teacher contract implications, as well as budget needs and tax implications. Please join us on Wednesday, March 11th, as a similar update to this evening will be presented, in addition to listening sessions to hear stakeholder input and feedback. Dr. Brad Wolgast, a parent and member of our own community, who also happens to be a board certified sleep expert, will also be joining us to share some information about adolescent sleep research. You can also email feedback and questions to schoolstarttime at wssd.org in the event that you cannot make it on Wednesday evening. We will do our very best to capture stakeholder input and feedback in a report to the school board. Before I close, I would just like to remind everyone here in the room and everyone listening at home and everyone in the community that no recommendations or decisions have been made. Thank you for allowing me to present our update in progress this evening, and I will do my best now to any answer any outstanding questions that the board may have. It's not usually such a big round of applause. So. I know. <laughs> well done. That was because the yeah. mic, you know, a little yeah. more. Here we go. Um, before we open things up for questions, uh, I do want to bring up one concern, and not to. I know the administration and the task force is like totally prepared for Wednesday evening to like move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but to throw a public health wet blanket on this maybe, um, I think that at this week in particular, I mean one of the recommendations is to try to avoid unnecessary large public gatherings. And I anticipate there may be, this may be a large public gathering, mm -hmm. bringing a lot of community members into the school. Um, I would just like to, and I'll, maybe open this up for comment as well as in our questions, um, is strongly consider not canceling this event, sure. but postponing it and just moving it ahead a little bit. Once we get a handle on what the right time frame would be, that might affect some of the, the timeline that you just laid out. But um, I would kind of open that up for comment to other board members in addition to questions you may have for Mr. Kroll. Now it's on. Is this, um, is it a conversation that maybe we should revisit after we hear from our, um, our colleague that's going to join us for a public health update? Sure. So we could, maybe we'll then take this time if people have questions about the specifics of some of the ideas that were laid out and then come back to the question of postponing at that time. Does anyone have questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you for the the update and all the work that you do on this. Uh, I, I, it's not so much a question because I know the answer to this, but uh, you're giving three options up there, but in reality there's four options we're thinking of here, and one is not having it change too. So when people uh, hear this, I want everyone to know that option A, B, and C are just three of inc include that don't include no change at all. So when we have the town hall meeting, if be it Wednesday or where, whenever it is, or even if you have feedback on email, we want to hear from you if you don't want to have any change and the reasons mm -hmm. why as well. Sure. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point to bring. I think we have been focused on the new ideas. We've been so focused on trying to figure out how this could work or we were going to make it work. And, you know, that was, it was more difficult than I think many of us realized. And I think that's why we saw that pivot midway through the year in our approach to how we were trying to solve the problem. With that being said, I think that that's comforting for people to hear. Uh, and I think that's also part of the process of, and discussion of you know, what, what is best for the community, be it one of the new ideas that we're um, vetting or um, you know, not changing school start time. So thank you for that. Okay, and just to clarify, I just want to reiterate, if, if this does get canceled, no decision is going to be made without an event no. like this. No. It just pushes everything back, so sure. by default, we may end up running out of time. Yeah, and I, I thank the board for actually pushing, you know, the initial timeline back of trying to make this work in the 2021 20, school year to the 21-22 school year. Uh, I think we've already felt under the gun, and that was going to be a tough thing to, you know, tough not to crack per se. Um, and I think that with that movement, that gave us more time to think about what we could accomplish in the following year. And certainly, I don't think that we need to make any decisions by the end of this April, especially considering we have, you know, other 
local crises and national crises with health. Okay, so just to reiterate, because this is, nothing's happening next year anyway, Correct. and option D is maybe nothing will happen even for the next year, there's no rush to do Correct. this on March 11th, Correct. right? Okay. okay. I have one question. So, sure. From the schools that have already made this change, because I know there are a few in the area, is there a way to get information about how they feel that has impacted the school community or the students, athletics? You know, just as you took those surveys uh, yes. of our own students, do they have surveys available of their students and how they feel after having made the change? I would have to check to see if there are surveys that w they have completed post making the change. I know Radnor's in the first year of doing this and there's other local districts that are looking at voting on this for an upcoming school year. We can certainly reach out to them. We do have contacts with some of their district officials to you know, see what continued feedback they have received from their community afterwards. I think it's, you know, depending on who you ask and you know, if they're a parent, student, I think it's all over the board, but they certainly might have metrics that we could look at. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Do you know if we have the event archived on the Start Times website? Because yes. I know we had some visitors from other districts. I think both of the events in the fall, the event where Dr. Troxell came in and spoke to the community was videotaped. I think also the panel event with Radner, the Radner officials and students was also um, videotaped. And I believe that is on the School Start Times website already. I will double check that tomorrow, okay. but I'll get back to you, Dr. Grandy. I'm pretty sure that it's uploaded for people to view. Great. So I would encourage people. There's a lot of great information on that website. And I think um, now that we have some specific ideas on the table, I think interest is, is rapidly <laughs> increasing in this issue. And we had some events in the fall that I think had a lot of great information at them. So I would encourage people to pull up the videos of those events if you want to get a little more background on the issue. And then I think, Marilyn, you had a... Yeah. I, I think it would be very helpful to have, have some experience from the other districts. I, I know we had the panel discussion last fall was it only mm -hmm. last fall but now they've had several more months of living with the time change and I would like updated information about yep. how that's going as well okay. to that end the um, legislative council for PSBA is talking about getting a forum together in the spring that would allow for more direct sharing of the feet on the ground and involving the school administrators so that they can directly one-to-one -one sort of share information. So that's that's already happening, the yeah. architecture of that. Yeah, because one of the issues that often comes up is, is the impact of, of changing the start times on athletics. Mm -hmm. And athletics may be moving around on its own because of the other districts that have been that have been shifting their times as well. Mm -hmm. And so having some information about that would be helpful. Sure. And that was a good segue because I was going to ask, uh, one of the most common uh, questions we have is how it will impact athletics. And I know we talked about Radnor has changed start time. And I know many other uh, Central League uh, schools have are, are started to look into it. So off the top of your head, do you know what other Central Leagues uh, are currently schools are looking at a change of start time such that it might be in the future almost every other Central League has a start time so that that's when the I do I do know Lower Marion is looking at it I think voting on it this spring or that was the anticipated idea um, Westchester is not in the Central League I don't believe but I think that they were also going to be voting on it sometime in March uh, outside of those two and Radnor um, to my knowledge I'm not aware like none are jumping off the top of my head but I can email you a list what's that upper 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 Darby upper, upper, upper Darby yeah, yeah. yes correct Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so that takes us to um, audience recognition. So this is the time for response to items for action on the agenda. Um, so just to clarify, the coronavirus discussion is under new business, so that would be in the comment period later if people want to uh, make comments about the field trip issues and whatnot. Um, so is there anyone who would like to speak tonight related to topics that are on the agenda? Okay. Um, so that takes us to minutes. Um, so our first item for action is the approval of the minutes from the February 24th regular business meeting, and I so move. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Uh, Kelly? Any discussion? All 
All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Item passes 8 to 0. Okay. Uh, we have 10 items for action this evening in personnel. Uh, are there any that anyone would like separated from the rest? Okay. Uh, so let me read through them. We have the approval of six retirements. Uh, we have three certified staff retiring. Kathleen Laird, a second grade teacher at West. Mark Taylor, a school counselor at the high school. Arminia Kubiak, a first grade teacher at West. All three effective at the end of the day, June 19th, 2020. We have three non-certified staff retiring. Ralph Harris, an electrician in the operations department, retiring March 31st. Marcella Adams, instructional support at SRS, retiring end of the day, June 17th. And Mary Mangaluzzo, an executive administrative assistant in student services, retiring uh, August 31st. Uh, we have a change in sta salary status for Patrick Clancy, moving from Master's Step 12 to Master's Plus 30 Step 12, and Kelly Marion, moving from Master's Step 8 to Master's Plus 30 Step 8. We have the approval of compensation for school nurses serving on the District Wellness Committee as stipulated at a rate of $37 per hour, not to exceed 25 hours per group. We have the approval of the 2019-2020 Spring Athletic Supplementals as stipulated. We have the approval of the 2019-2020 Activity Advisor Appointments. There are three as listed in the agenda. We have the approval of compensation for high school frosh dance chaperones, and this was previously approved, but now the names of the chaperones are, are on the agenda for approval. Uh, we have the approval of a non-supplemental theater position for the 2020 Spring Musical at the high school as listed in the agenda. We have the approval of one conference request as listed in the agenda. And finally, we have the approval of the 2020 elementary and secondary summer school appointments as stipulated in the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? Chapin? Do we have a second? Second. Michelle? Any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, items pass 8 to 0. That takes us to curriculum, where we have three items for action. We have the approval of the 2019-2020 school year related service provider contracts, as stipulated. We have the approval for homebound instruction, as stipulated. And we have the approval of a professional services agreement with effective school solutions to provide specialized clinical therapeutic services for the period July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2020, 20, 2021 at an amount not to exceed $244,490 plus $4,000 per mental health professional for extended school year. All items in this section are as attached or described in the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Kelly? Do we have a second? Second. Marilyn? Any discussion? Um, I have a few questions. Um, is this our second or third year with ESS? Um, yes. I believe it is the third year. Okay. And I guess I'm wondering or hoping that we're collecting data on the utilization of services um, for our students and if we're collecting any outcome data on the, um, the quality of uh, treatment that the students are receiving and whether symptom relief is being obtained? I would have to ask Dr. McCullough to get that, but I do know when we had gone to the start of this school year, she had provided me with some clinical data so that I had an understanding of where we were, like once we had finished the year, all that we had collected, but I am not sure about all of the outcomes. That's the part I'm hesitating to answer you on, and I'd rather get that directly from Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? <coughs> okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? The items pass 8 to 0. We have four items for approval in finance. We have the approval of a fee proposal and additional services fee, if necessary, for appraisal reports as listed in the agenda. We have the approval to enter into an agreement regarding the assessment for the property as listed in the agenda. We have the approval of a E-plus quotation for the purchase of wireless access points contingent on the receipt of E-rate funding and inclusion in the 2020-2021 district budget. 
This will authorize the district to add additional wireless access points throughout the middle school building. E-rate is expected to pay 40% of the cost. The net cost to the district is estimated to be $31,993.92. Um, it's very precise. Uh, we have the approval of a service agreement with the Chester County Intermediate Unit to provide a network and systems technician as stipulated in the agenda. Um, again, all of these are as attached or described in the agenda. Um, do I have a motion? I move. Chapin? Do we have a second? Second. Michelle? Any discussion? That was a yes or a no? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, Please. question. Since um, the wireless access points going into the middle school, you know, just being in the high school this weekend and all the parents running around saying, why can't we get cell service in here because of the musical? Is there any, are we, what's our plan there? Are we doing, are we beefing it up? Is it intentional that we're not? I think this is one of those things that nobody quite understands. I'll actually take that one. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Finlayson before he left. A uh, couple of years ago, I had asked him to look at our service in all of our buildings. The buildings that we have the most difficult time getting service in are the high school and SRS, and it's a function of the structure of the building. At that time, he was looking to see if we could have put what I'm going to call a booster on, and the cost at the time to get an increased level of service was exorbitant, and it was not something that would solve the problem. It would get better in certain spots, but not totally. And before he had left, I had asked him if he knew anything else that might be different in terms of technology. He did not, but I don't think we shouldn't continue to explore it. There's not a quick fix for our lack of connectivity. Sorry. And it's not an it's intentional thing. No, it is not. It bothers me too when I'm in the building. I can't get service either. So we have not put a lead dome no. over the high school. Okay. That's, or maybe we should. I don't know. <laughs> too much cell phone use. Um, uh, any other discussion on that item? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Items pass 8 to 0. Okay, um, so that takes us time for uh, audience recognition for topics that are not on the agenda for action this evening. Um, so we do have time for comments from the audience for things we didn't just vote on. And just as a reminder, um, only district residents or taxpayers can speak and, by the purpose, and the purpose of public comment is to address the board on matters that may come before the board for its consideration. Um, anyone who would like to speak, we do just want to remind you that um, that you'll need to go to the podium and um, whatever you, you do say will be broadcast and recorded um, and the recording will be posted uh, on the district website and we just ask you to state your name and address when you do go to the podium. So is there anyone who would like to address the board? Yeah. If you, yeah, I think the podium will. Um, so, our, uh, my name is Nate. And I'm uh, Amelia Gallo. And uh, we are from SRS. And before we read the letter, which we have wrote to Dr. Tuck, um, um, I would like to say that I'm aware that the, um, uh, I'm aware that the books have been returned, um, but um, just, uh, but we still feel that this matter needs to be talked about, so, yeah. I have recently received the news that all of the LGBTQ plus books have been removed from our class library. I don't know exactly why you decided to do this, but I do know a little about it. I'm aware that a family has complained about having LGBTQ plus books for whatever reason, but I feel strongly about keeping these books. One reason is that one of my best friends who some of my best friends who go to SRS are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Even though some families have complained about having LGBTQ plus books in their in their or their children in their or their children's classes. Um, but I think we should keep these books because SRS needs to represent all the LGBT plus people out there. In some countries it is against the law to be LGBTQ to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and more. 
Also, some homophobic people have kicked their children out of their house because their children were LGBTQ+. It is also important for the children to understand that it is okay to be LGBTQ+, and they need to learn that is, uh, to not be discriminative and inclusive and to be inclusive to the people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and, and I think it was not right to handle, um, to handle this uh, in this way. We should talk to the families who complained and we should figure out a better solution than to take away all the books about people who are LGBTQ+. Some kids even resort to hurting themselves because they are taught that being LGBTQ+, is wrong. So please reconsider your decision to take away all the books um, that represent the LGBTQ+, community and make SRS an LGBTQ+, friendly school. Um, I'd like to say one more thing before we leave the podium. Um, I go on a bus at SRS at the end of the day, and I, so I have been discriminated against on the bus before for being LGBT, and I just feel that we need to have stricter guidelines against what people can and cannot do against these types of things, as it is a very serious matter, and children can get very hurt by this. Well, th well, I just want to thank the two of you for having the courage to, to write your letter and to take the podium today. I think that your experiences are incredibly important for everyone to hear about. Uh, and at the same time, I think you're setting a wonderful example for not just your own classmates, but for many adults in the community as well. So thank you. Are there Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Good evening. My name is Jill Fenton. I have a son that's a fourth grader at SRS. My son has two parents. We're married. We live in Swarthmore. We live in the same household. We're both women. We're both white. Our son is black. We are a transracial family formed through adoption of our son Cooper at birth. You're gonna hear things tonight. Um, you're gonna hear clear, credible, compelling um, testimony on why as the board it's so important that you rigorously press the administration to bring forth proposals to you and policies for your approval and your review that will ensure that we have an environment in our schools that will protect and nurture our children to become the best possible versions of themselves. But what I wanna talk about right now is the need for this board to rigorously and relentlessly demand that the administration is held accountable for implementation of these policies. Our children need adults to create policies and processes that will allow them to become the best possible versions of themselves. But they are, these policies are largely invisible to the children. And as our young friend just pointed out, Children are much more highly influenced and affected by what they see and feel and experience on a daily basis from teachers, staff, bus drivers, peers, specials teachers, the all-powerful and mighty lunch ladies. <laughs> and so because of that, we have to step up and we have to really do a much better job in making sure that these policies aren't just words on paper, but they become part of what we do and what we see and what we say and what our ch children experience. What good is it to have books in the library or in the classroom that embrace gender diversity, gender nonconformity, gender fluidity, sexual preference, and then to have a young girl repeatedly teased because she doesn't conform to some bogus stereotype of femininity 
and be teased on the playground and in classroom for looking like a boy. And often in earshot of staff or a teacher and they miss the opportunity for a teachable moment. The four cornerstones of SRS, do you know what they are? Right? Kindness, courage, self-control, and manners. And yet our son, who has two moms, is constantly told and teased that he's going to be gay someday because of it. Cooper doesn't see anything wrong with being gay. It wouldn't be a problem for him if he was. He just told he just told me the other day that right now he thinks he'll marry a woman. And it'll probably be Yolanda Adams, Cheryl Knox, or Diana Ross in that order. <laughs> but the most frustrating thing, and Cooper cries about it, he doesn't understand why would kids say this to begin with? And why doesn't somebody stop them? And how is it possible, folks, how is it possible in a district that is progressive enough to have every single fourth grader participate in an all African American living wax museum, to have a black child here from the time that he's in kindergarten that we don't see color here at SRS, to hear it from teachers and staff. My wife and I have heard it in IEP meetings. And I guarantee you that every black, brown child in that school knows that color matters. And if you don't see color, and you say you don't see color, then you know what they're hearing? You don't see me. And if you don't know Cooper, and haven't had the pleasure of meeting him, he's 10 years old in fourth grade, he's taller than I am. He wears a size nine and a half shoe and a men's large shirt. <laughs> Cooper has looked like he was in med middle school since he was in second grade. Now imagine, and you have to imagine this, because if you don't parent a child of color, you can only imagine this. But imagine having to talk to your second grader about the fact that when he is out, without the umbrella of your white privilege, he's going to be seen as a threat in second grade and having to choke back the tears where you have your second grader practice over and over. My name is Cooper Fenton. I'm seven years old. I have nothing that can harm you. Please don't shoot me in the event that he's ever profiled by a policeman that looks just like his mom or his mommy or most of the people in this room and the people on this board. Words matter, friends. Actions matter. Our children learn from them. Inaction speaks louder than words to kids. So I ask you, please step up and be the difference. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, please go to the podium. Good evening, and thank you to the members of the board for the opportunity to address you tonight. My name is Melissa Kennedy, and we have two children in the Wallingford uh, Strathaven, Wallingford Swarthmore School District. My oldest is a seventh grader at SHMS, a transgender boy, and one of the bravest people I know. Um, he struggled with gender dysphoria throughout much of his tenure at SRS. Um, and I have often spoken about how very, very grateful I am to be living in a community that is so supportive and accepting. And I truly believed that until last month. Um, so I'm sure that everyone in this room can identify with how powerful it is to read about a character in a book um, or an experience in a book that you can relate to. It can make you feel more human, it can make you feel less alone, it can make you feel seen. Um, for me, that was Meg in A Wrinkle in Time with her nerdy clumsiness and all of her faults, and of course, Joe in Little Women. Um, 
Children and adults need to see themselves reflected in the media around us. And at the elementary school level, it is arguably one of the most important media is books. Books on the shelves and books in the library. But people like my son, just like many other LGBTQ youth, they rarely, if ever, come across a character that's like them, that has the shared experience of their life and their struggles. As I'm sure you all know, as it's popular to report in the media, the incidence of depression and suicidality in LGBTQ youth is concerningly high, around 43% by most reports. Um, and that's largely related to the social stigma, not the actual experience of being LGBTQ. But an accepting community can change that. Even one accepting adult can reduce suicidality by 40%. And that is where the school community can make a difference. That is where creating an acceptive and inclusive, envir inclusive environment in the school can actually save lives. And an inclusive environment includes a diverse book selection. Um, and I don't think that these are mature themes. These are books about people like my son, who started struggling with his gender around the age of four, and who attended SRS as a girl who looked like a boy for all six years that he was there. It's people like Jill's family. These are your students, your peers, your neighbors, the people in your community, and we can literally save these students' lives with the messages that we convey. And to that end, I'd like to applaud the administration for returning the books to the classroom because that was the right move to make. But I also want to emphasize the damage that was done that was by removing them in the first place. Because words can't be unsaid, as we know. Messages can't be unsent. It's like that old um, classroom uh, demonstration where you crumple up the piece of paper and then you smooth it back out. It's still wrinkled. It's still damaged. And the message that was sent was that being LGBTQ is somehow wrong. And that even wanting to learn about that experience is something that's questionable. And so that's why we're here tonight to implore the board, you as the board, and we as a community to take steps to ensure that a situation like this does not occur again. Because right now today, we're a school community where acts of discrimination against LGBTQ students occur. It may not be who we want to be, but it is who we are. And so we, as a group of concerned parents and community, would like to acknowledge some uncomfortable truths and start having some awkward conversations so that we can start progressing towards who we want to be. And I really hope and I really believe that who we want to be is a truly inclusive and accepting school community where um, one where a policy supporting transgender and gender expansive youth is not just a document that we can access on the website, but something that the students, the administration, and the staff live every single day in every interaction that they have with the students because inaction matters. And a policy is one thing, but stepping in when children are being teased on the bus or when messages are being stated in the classroom, that's the difference that we can make in these students' lives. So we ask the, that the board rigorously hold the administration accountable for intentional and consistently appropriate implementation of inclusive policies because the children are watching and we're watching too and we support this effort because for a lot of it, us, our children's lives depend on it. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Great. My name is Mary Huff, and I have uh, twins, 17-year-old seniors. They're about to leave. You're going, why the heck are you here, right? I'm here because I am a homophobic lesbian. And why that's important? Well, let's talk about why it's important because of the kids in this school district. Without that literature, without understanding what will become of these children later on, then you're creating, you're part of the issue. I don't believe a majority of these people here tonight are people who 
don't believe what we're all talking about. I think if it if there's somebody else, I'd be surprised. We are the team that should be there working for this. Prior planning prevents poor performance. And that's what everybody's discussed in regards to policy. And uh, the reason I bring this up is 12 years ago, my kids were in first grade at Wes. My son's godmother was supervisor at the attic, the LGBTQ organization in Center City. I donated $1,000 to have an in-service done at West because I was concerned about my kids moving through this school district, even though I heard it, you know, Swarthmore, Wallingford, very progressive, but I came from West Texas. I'm homophobic and I'm a lesbian. What about those straight people out there? You know, I'm like, can I really trust them? So I wanted to help teach and help this, at least the teachers understand what it's like. So you're wondering, did that happen? No. The principal said to me and my partner, she said, you know, this is really wonderful. We think it's great, but I think we will decline this request. This was at the same time that the transgender student in Ardmore, that whole issue, I don't know if any of y'all remember that, back 12 years ago was going on. And she's like, oh, this would cause so much trouble in this school district. And I was very upset about that at the time. But my kids, they liked it here. They've had a pretty good run, although at times, you know, it took my kids till they were juniors in high school to have friends juniors in high school to have good friends. Should that happen? No, because I know about the underlying homophobia my two straight kids, you know, have suffered in this school district. And I think it's important that all of us have this voice, all of us tell you tonight, because as much as we love this school district, I, don't, I wouldn't be doing my due diligence for the younger kids coming up unless I told you my thoughts on this. So thank you for listening. Thank you for the ride. It's been fun. Go to Music Man. That's where my kids are trying out tonight. <laughs> so let's hope it works. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Is there any, anyone else who would like to make a comment? Please. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Grandy. My name is Michael Raphael. I live at 404 Drew Avenue here in Swarthmore. I am one member of the group of parents and students that came here tonight to share our concerns arising from the removal of three books from a fifth grade classroom at SRS. And I'd like to take a moment first, since I'm just one of many, to have those who are here on that issue to please stand to show the board who's here for what. Thank you all. As you may know, the three books at issue are George by Alex Gino, Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World by Ashley Herring Blake, and When Aiden Became a Brother by Kyle Lukoff. It is our understanding that when concern was expressed about one of these books, not all three, a building administrator at SRS directed that all three be removed from the classroom simultaneously and exclusively because of the single thing they have in common. They all feature LGBTQIA plus protagonists. The speakers before me have done a much better job than I ever could addressing how the removal of these books and the deeming of LGBTQIA plus themes, issues, and characters as inherently mature or inherently violent is tantamount to making those themes, issues, and characters taboo, which in turn results in the harmful othering of our LGBTQIA plus children. I therefore wish to address the progress the district has made thus far, what still needs to be done, and why it needs to be done. First, with respect to the district's progress, it is our understanding, as my daughter's classmates said, that the three books have been returned to the classroom 
In addition to that, their appropriateness for our fifth grade readers has been confirmed by the district administration. And I do want to note, I don't believe that that was ever really in doubt. George is on the fifth grade shelf at the SRS library. Ivy Aberdeen's letter to the world is available through third through sixth grade students through the Scholastic Book Club with which the district partners. And when Aiden became a brother, is a Fontas and Pinnell level N book aimed at third graders. The district has also acknowledged, to my understanding, that the book's removal did perpetrate anti-LGBTQIA plus stigma. We have also heard that the district has recognized the need for policies and procedures to ensure the availability of books by diverse authors and featuring diverse characters, issues, themes, and perspectives. We are glad for that progress, but recognize that more is needed. For the district to ensure that its libraries are inclusive, I respectfully suggest that we must first begin with an equity audit to learn where we are right now in terms of the diversity of our school and classroom libraries. From there, the decision-making process, policies and procedures for book acquisition and parent challenges to books need to be both transparent to the community and designed to include diverse books. And the implementation of those policies must involve people who not only bring to bear perspective from their own diverse communities, but who have been properly trained and vetted and qualified to ensure that their involvement diminishes rather than increases the effect of both conscious and unconscious biases on the district's book selections. Because if you'll allow me, if there's anything that our current political environment has taught us, no matter what your policies and procedures are, if you have people involved who don't believe in them, they're not going to be enforced. We believe that at least these are necessary to ensure that unlawful and discriminatory censorship does not happen in our school again. Finally, the speakers before me have discussed the harm that the removal of these books caused to our community LGBTQIA plus children, and they've done it, again, far better than I ever could. So I want to point out how important it is to all of our children to experience books featuring a range of authors, excuse me, I believe that's a lot, perspectives, characters, issues, and themes so they can access the full richness of humanity. Representation for underrepresented peoples and content in media is vitally important not just for the underrepresented but for those of us who are already, like me, plenty represented. When those of our children who are privileged, white, heterosexual, and cisgendered have the opportunity through reading, through books like George or Ivy Dean Aberdeen or When Aiden Became a Brother, to put themselves in the shoes of someone who is not like them, it helps build the vital cognitive skill of perspective taking. And that skill is, in my experience, a foundational component of empathy, understanding, and civil discourse. The inclusion for which we are advocating, therefore, isn't just the right thing to do for those who finally get to be included. It's a benefit to everyone in our district because it makes all of our children more insightful, more competent, and more kind. And exclusion, like what we saw with the removal of these books for the last three weeks, is commensurately harmful to our community. We therefore ask that the board ensure that the district treats its continued progress towards undoing the harm of this anti-LGBTQIA plus censorship with appropriate seriousness, urgency, and transparency. And finally, I have two gifts for the board. One is a collection of the various emails and letters that have been sent to the board and the district over the last three weeks. Um, and I'm sure that you have many of these, perhaps not all, so I wanted to offer them up. And in addition, I have six copies each of George and Ivy Aberdeen's Letters to the World for those who would like them free of charge.
there anyone else who would like to address? Okay, please do. Um, my name is Alex Melly. I'm a senior at Strathaven High School. My name's Grayson. I'm also a senior at Strathaven. Um, some of the board members were here last year. I know that we have a couple of new ones. I actually, around this time last year, uh, made a statement to an empty room um, that was really surrounding the ideas of diversity and inclusion. And I can tell you that as a senior at Strathaven High School, I actually didn't go to elementary school here. I came here, I moved here in seventh grade. And um, we do live in a really, really accepting community. We do, and that's a great, great thing. But as you heard from the students, as you heard from the parents, as I'm sure you could hear from, from some teachers, because I hear from you know some of them, it's not talked about enough, not nearly enough. Um, the idea that there are people that are being ostracized in the world is something that doesn't get talked about enough, period. Um, and diversity and inclusion, you know, both Grayson and I have made efforts in high school to be involved in clubs that talk about that stuff, but I'm not sure if that, if we were, that we'd actually be exposed to all that, because, um, with all due respect to the sleep study, Ms. Ms. Crowley, you've done an amazing job, <laughs> I've heard about the sleep study at least 10 or 15 times in the last year or two. Um, I can easily count on one hand the amount of times that we've had seminars or, uh, days or surveys uh, collecting information about the the feelings of LGBTQ youth, about the feelings of black and brown youth at Strathaven High School. I can count on the number of times that we've talked about mental health, um, which you know clearly does not get addressed enough. Um, and it's it's one of these things that just you know it can go. There's there's a lot of particulars that you know you've gotten into, and I don't I don't want to step on anyone's toes here. But what we really have to center to what it's about is the kids. Because um, we are a school district, um, we're local government, and that's a great thing. We're all active community members, and that's also a great thing. But you know, at the very end of the day, you're not serving a higher ideal. You're not serving something super complex. You're serving the little kid in a classroom who thinks they're weird. Guess what? They're not weird. They're really normal, and it's really hard for them to grow up and be surrounded by people that are constantly telling them they're not normal. It's really hard for them to look at TV and see people calling people names. It's really hard to be in an environment where you're called names um, when all you're trying to do is get an education. Um, and I just, you know, I just think that I want to re realign everything. We're about to leave Strathaven High School, and I can tell you overwhelmingly, it's, you know, Fast Fury has been a positive experience, but I, I have a little sister. I know you have younger siblings. There's younger kids. There's people being born. There's people being moved in the district, and I can't tell you what, but a, what a big advertisement it is for this district, for this board, for our community members to stand up for these issues because they're just basic human rights. <laughs> it's really not, it's actually really not that complex. And guess what? I bet you these elementary school students know it a hell of a lot more better than some of the adults in the world. Um. I originally wasn't gonna come up here, um, but after hearing everyone else share their stories and everything that they had to say, um, thank you for doing that because it gave me courage um, you know, to come up here. I've been at Strathaven for all 12 years of my education and um, you know, my experience wasn't always a good one. Um, my freshman year of high school, I came out as transgender to everyone at the school and for, you know, since then, it hasn't been, it hasn't been good. I went through a very long time in my life where I could not go to school um, without having panic attacks. And I couldn't come home from school without, you know, thinking about ending my life that night because of all the bullying and harassment that I had to go through just because people didn't understand, um, and people didn't accept who I am. And I, the past two years, I've been um, educating. I've been going around to like different places. Um, I've even spoken to the school here um, about you know my experiences and like how we can bring LGBTQ topics more into classrooms. And I've brought it into classrooms, um, but it's not enough because people aren't listening. When I go into classrooms, when I talk, I'm just that weird LGBTQ kid, you know? Like, people don't really listen, and um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been 
easy for me because of that. And we need to normalize this in classrooms. We need more people who are like me so that me being 13 years old and sitting in middle school um, afraid to show the world who I am, I, that would have never happened to me. And listening to all of these stories and thinking about what could happen if we don't change something that other kids could end up like me is heartbreaking because I would never want any other student, any other child to go through what I had to. So the message that I want to send out tonight is that visibility is beyond important. It is um, vital to not only the mental health of the students, but education. So thank you. Anyone else who would like to make a comment? Oh. Hi, Dawn Dankinich, Wallingford Elementary School kindergarten teacher, also proud parent of transgender son. Um, I just wanted to relate to you that, and I'll obviously live here, he's an alumni, and um, we'll be watching this and hopefully I'll make him proud. Um, I just wanted to say that teaching kindergarten, um, it's just about every other day that someone mentions to someone else in the room, oh, you're wearing girl colors, or you shouldn't be doing that. And how nice it would be to break open my book that Matt buys me every year for Christmas that I have not shared in my classroom, only with parents who have children who are gender questioning or who have transgender children themselves. Um, would it be able to, to open up the book and be like, hey, let's read the book, Boys Wear Pink. How nice would that be? So I just want you to know that it's not just a middle school thing, it's not just an elementary thing, it's a real life thing. And not only do these kids, are transgender questioning or gender questioning children, do they need to see that they're accepted, but our regular typical cis kids need to see that transgender kids, gender questioning children are just as normal as they are. And I'm telling you, reading a book about do boys wear pink is not going to turn anyone transgender or anyone gay that I know of. <laughs> but it would definitely would be a great opportunity to have a conversation with the kids in the classroom and to be able to say, you know, some children do prefer to wear pink and that's okay, which is what I say anyway. But it would be nice to have a piece of literature to back it up. And also when there's a conversation that we had earlier this year, I should say we didn't have the conversation. The conversation happened in the, in, during the snack time. Um, and my teaching assistant and I were sort of looking at each other. The, the children were saying, I heard that men can marry men. And they were like, ooh, can they really? And I heard, oh, can women marry women? And like, Mrs. Dankinich, and I was like, oh, ask your parents, ask your parents, because I, I didn't want to be brought up here. <laughs> so I just think it's a lot of good that can come from having great literature exposed to our children and to be able, just like we do with any other topic, be able to talk about it in a very um, comfortable, age-appropriate level. And it really comes down to choosing good books, good selections, and being very careful with our speech and our intentions. So that's all. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you. OK. Anyone else like to comment? OK. I just want to thank every, oh, we got one more, please. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Roland Reddick Zoufle. Uh, what I'd like to say is I've got something I think you should all think about. So y we've all been thinking about, we've all been having this discu these discussions about how we treat the LG. LGBTQ plus people in, 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 in this world, and I feel like, and I feel like after all of this, you need to just think, how can I help help someone, 
a homosexual person when I see them? Like, how can I, like, 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 like what can I do to make this world a, a, a better place for someone who is, like, like for me, like, I should be able to think, like, I'm a straight white ma male. Like, I, I need to think about how I could help someone who is not, who is not of my sexuality. And I think, I think that we all need to think, think about someone besides their, homosexual. I feel like, like, an important way is, like, just thinking about, like, like, how, like, how, about how, like, your, what position you're at, like, if, like, a student or, or someone on the, on this, on the, on the school board or, or, or a teacher or a parent or a, or, a, or like a principal or a teacher, or yeah, something, like, about like what your role or, or permits you to do to help people. I, I, I just want you to, th just to think about that. And like, at, like, the, like, at night, just think about what I said, about what I said, about, like, how, how can you help people or just try to help more people. Okay. <laughs> well said. I just wanted to add something very quickly. My name's Pam Lieberman. I live in Swarthmore. My kids are almost, almost out of the system. And as you can see here from the caring, an eloquence of the children who have the courage to speak up and come to an adult meeting. And as Roland showed us, young children, elementary aged children are curious, exceptionally bright. They um, absorb everything around them, verbal and nonverbal. And I know that there are occasional, you know, diversity programs in the middle school and the high school, but, but when you get to that level, the kids who are white um, and the norm, they think, oh, well, now let's talk about those other people. I just think that we need to give um, the credit where it's due to the younger children. They have the compassion and to start learning that we're all humans just makes them even more compassionate and, um, you know, better humans. <laughs> Anyone else who would like to comment? So I just want to thank uh, all of you for coming out. I want to thank all of you for sharing your stories. Uh, I want to thank the kids in the room for having the courage to go to the podium. Um, again, I just want to say how important I think the voices of kids can be and tell your classmates to do the same thing. Um, but I think you've given uh, the district, I think the board, a lot to think about. Um, and we really appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of the meeting, uh, we have asked the administration to um, really look seriously at our policies and implementation um, and would like to have a, a discussion about this topic um, at a future board meeting, not too far in the future. I don't have a specific date yet, um, but we want to have another conversation about this. So thank you. Um, moving on um, uh, to old business, um, and then we'll move on to the coronavirus discussion. Um, do we have any old business? Okay. Oh, we do. I don't know if this is technically old business, Just but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, yeah. Usually, we can tell how overburdened Dr. Palmer is with all of her duties because she didn't mention the musical, and usually she mentions. You know all the great things that went on, I so am I just so sorry. That was okay. fabulous. It, <laughs> it was. I, I was just going to say a shout out to all the kids who aren't on stage. You know all the ones who make the production happen and all of the support that makes that makes the space for the kids to be able to shine on the stage and in the pit, which was also on the stage this year. So a big shout out to everybody involved at every level and all the parents that support the programs and get their kids to rehearsals and all of that other stuff. So to everyone who didn't get applause this weekend, applause. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we will move to new business. And as I mentioned, we wanna have a discussion today. Um, one of the more pressing decisions is that we have some 
field trips that are planned uh, at both the middle school and high school and then actually an, an elementary trip as well. Um, and, um, you know, I think given everything going on with concerns around um, coronavirus and how, you know, populations are mixing and travel and exposures to potential higher risk situations, I think we want to have a, a conversation today. We won't be voting uh, today um, about uh, taking an action on a field trip, but we want to have a conversation today. I've invited uh, a, a colleague from the University of Pennsylvania. We'll see if this, we've never tried this before. I hope it doesn't freeze but we'll see if this works. Uh, so Dr. Canusio uh, is a uh, associate professor at the University of Pencil Pennsylvania in family medicine and community health and an epidemiologist. And for those that uh, didn't catch the article in the Philly Inquirer this past weekend, um, I think there was some uh, great background on, on how to think about uh, decreasing risk uh, that, that Dr. Canusio was quoted in that article. So I, I begged and pleaded to see if she could uh, spend a little time with us tonight. I know she's been probably waiting on that video for a while. So uh, thank you, Dr. Canusio. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. Just okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so to kick off this discussion, I'm going to ask Dr. Palmer, our superintendent, just to set the stage uh, just for a moment to just review um, some of the travel that is planned. Um, and then I thought maybe we'll turn things over to you for a few minutes to um, you know, offer some of your comments on how we might think about uh, what considerations we might think about in terms of next steps. Okay, thank you, Dr. Grande. In terms of big trips that we have um, upcoming and in terms of timeliness, I'm going to go through just the types of trips that we have, just the big ones, not the, the smaller ones. So the first trip that we have coming up is our band trip. It takes place on March 21st through March 24th. It involves 230 children, and it would be set to go to Orlando this year. The next trip we have is for the high school. I'm sorry, for the middle school. It would be the exchange trip going to Germany. Germany is currently on a level two state advisory, and it involves 17 students, and that one would take place in May. We also have another trip that is sooner than June will be our Williamsburg trip for NPE. It is all of our fifth graders. We've got about 100 students, 53 chaperones, and seven staff members going on that trip. And going back to Germany, we have a trip in June for the high school involving 17 students. And then we have two middle school trips, Quebec City in June, for 42 students, and then Costa Rica in June for 23 students. So it is a significant concern for us as we're looking at all of the travel advisories and the spread of the coronavirus. We are monitoring this, but we are also trying to balance. This is a wonderful opportunity for our children. They are board-approved trips. We would love them to go. We don't want to cut off the experience, but we need to make sure our children and our staff are safe. I think that sets the stage. Great. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. So, um, Dr. Canusio, do you think you could um, perhaps offer some, some general comments for the board and some considerations that we might um, look into as we kind of think through our options here? Absolutely. So, I know that many of us in the public health community have been reading very closely the data coming out of China, South Korea, Italy, Iran, and now the U.S. And there's a sense here in the U.S. that it has become time for us to institute what we call social distancing measures. Um, because we have no immunity to the virus, we have to use public health control strategies that may disrupt our normal daily routines. You'll hear a lot about attempts to isolate people who are ill and to quarantine people who come into contact with them. And those are our early strategies and our very important strategies for limiting the rate of new infections. So it's important for us to think about the curve. I don't know if you can see me. I talk with my hands. You can see what I'm saying? Yes, we see you. I'm picture for you of the curve of new cases of coronavirus. And this is the shape of the curve in China. And now China has instituted very strict social distancing measures 
quarantine and isolation, and they've done an incredible job, albeit with draconian measures, to control the virus and to limit its spread. We here in the United States are on the initial part of the curve, as far as we know, because we're, we've been delayed in testing. So in the next few days, you can expect to hear a lot about an increased number of identified people. A lot of because there's a backlog of people who have been ill but not yet tested. What we talk about in epidemiology is we want to flatten that curve. But we don't want it to escalate like this. We don't want a fast and furious outbreak. That fast and furious outbreak put incredible strain on our health system and will exceed our capacity to provide care in hospital settings for people who are experiencing So, public health professionals like Dr. Graham and like me are calling upon our community to think about this as a collective effort to slow the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. So what does this mean for all of us? This means that we need to think very carefully about these early cases of COVID-19 as the fuel for the fire. And we do not want to throw gasoline on the fire. We don't want to add fuel. And the, the fuel for an epidemic really is anything that large anything that moves new populations in contact with one another. And so travel in particular poses a real challenge for the control of epidemic spread. What, what I want to say to all of us is that there are steps to be taken and that it's particularly important for us to intervene now and to change our behavior now in the short term to limit large gatherings, to limit travel, to try to take ourselves out of the situation as much as possible so that we're not providing the virus a fertile ground or a vulnerable host to take on the culture. So many people have been calling and asking in the past week about their own family travel plans. Schools are asking my opinion about upcoming travel groups. And I think we have several considerations as we begin as a community to engage very actively in our part to contain the spread of the disease. And namely, one, we want to protect our families and the people we love. And that means limiting our families' engagement in large, large group gatherings and in travel. Two, we want to protect vulnerable members of our own communities. We want to protect in particular our elders and people with chronic illnesses who are highly susceptible to adverse outcomes if infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. And third, in considering travel, we want to think about the possibility that we may seed epidemics in the places we visit, or we may re-import infection to our home communities. In addition, if we consider travel with large groups of students, the larger the group, the greater the opportunity for one member of that group to become infected, um, the greater the potential for that group to have its own movement restricted for people to get stranded or quarantined in remote locations away from their families, away from their usual sources of medical care. So I think I'll pause there. Um, these are all the considerations that public health officials will be, uh, will be thinking about in making recommendations. I think for your school community, it's important to think about one's own family. It's important to think about vulnerable people within our home community. It's important to think about communities we may visit, and it's important to think about really trying to act early and change our behavior now so that we can flatten the curve and really try to relieve the pressure that our health systems will certainly experience in the coming weeks and months. I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Canusio. And 
before I ask if, if board members have questions, you know, I think that, you know, one way um, we might think about this is, is Dr. Palmer laid out a series of trips, and each of those trips involves a certain um, set of dates that have implications, I think, in terms of cancellation. Um, and so we might be able to think about the trips that require more immediate decisions, and then we might be able to think about trips where a decision could perhaps be delayed somewhat to see how the situation evolves and um, you know how that kind of shifts thinking, perhaps. Um, are there folks who have questions for Dr. Canusio? And then um, once we move past that point, I might like spring her loose, and then we can have a conversation here. So, Damon. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I have a question. It's more to lay to rest a misconception that I've been hearing people say that when the weather warms up, it won't have an effect. Now, clearly that, that's people, that has nothing to do with virology, but uh, could you explain that, that uh, about how weather would affect or wouldn't affect uh, something like this? The, the only true answer to your question is that we have no way of knowing for sure with this new virus how it's going to behave. Um, of course, flu and with other coronavirus, we have seen patterns of seasonality, declining incidence in warmer months. Um, we don't know yet if this virus uh, will persist in warmer months. I have to say that on a 70 degree day, I kept thinking I pray this virus aboard the heat. Um, but really, it's a wait and see. We can't say definitively one way or another, and we certainly cannot count on that to buy up time. We need to act now in every way possible to increase social distancing measures and to really uh, rigorously engage in hand hygiene and in um, staying home with any respiratory virus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Other questions from board members? Okay. I have one oh, quick one. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Jen. Thank you uh, for being here. I just have a quick question, kind of on the heels of um, the last question you just fielded. Can you you can hear my voice? Okay. I can. Okay. I can't hear you. She can't see you, but she can. Hear you. Oh. Okay. oh. Okay. That's okay. Um, on the heels of the last question, are we seeing lower incidences in states that do have a warmer climate? Uh, are you asking about the U.S.? Yes. I would tell you, so honestly, that the rate of testing in, in the U.S. is incomplete, it's in its infancy, and we cannot count on any numbers that we're seeing from across the United States. There's high variation across states in the number of test kits available and the number of tests that can be run. Um, and I absolutely expect that as our capacity to increase testing increases in the coming days and weeks, we will see large increases in case counts in part because of a backlog of people who have not been tested but have been ill in, the, in our community. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, hi, uh, I asked, I, I'm going to ask another question. Uh, so in Delaware County, there's at least one confirmed case, and in the Philadelphia area, we ha are starting to get some confirmed cases. In places like Italy or Iran or other places where it's gotten really, not out of control, but a much uh, a higher amount, how long did it take from just a few cases to get to like a much larger amount? So I can tell you that my family was in Northern Italy skiing two weeks ago. And uh, there was no news really of the outbreak before they uh, before they left for the trip, and it ramped up appreciably during the week that they were there, and has since escalated dramatically to the point that now the entire country has restricted movement and is on, is on lockdown. So there will be in the United States a dramatic increase in social distancing measures and in the number of cases we see. And I think it's very, very important for educators and parents uh, and the board to be communicating actively with our children about this, not to 
um, shock them, but to prepare them that we need their engagement and their cooperation and that we will do everything we can to keep life as normal for them. So in Italy, it went from almost nothing to uh, two weeks ago to where it is now, and we can't blame that on the normal Italian administration abilities. No. <laughs> I, um, it's very Italian. helpful to look at the Italian example because in China, the authoritarian regime and also a collectivist uh, spirit allowed for very extreme social distancing measures and people complied with those measures. And there were it, there were there was strict enforcement of those measures. Italy is a society much more like ours that in their prizing of independence and freedom of movement um, and democratic ideals. And uh, we can see that it's going to be much more difficult to implement some of these measures in Italy. But we should learn from them that there's an inevitability to the increase in the number of cases and the number of fatalities too, unless we intervene rigorously in the early days of an outbreak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others? All right. Thank you, Dr. Canusio. We You're appreciate welcome. your time. Um, so, you know, I would suggest uh, to the board that we have some trips that are imminent. Um, that, uh, in particular, the high school trip to Florida is is beyond imminent <laughs> in terms of the timing of it. Uh, it involves a very large percentage of our student body uh, traveling to a very a heavily visited area by people from all around the world, frankly, uh, and certainly all around the country. And I think if our first consideration is really thinking uh, about the health and safety of, of our students, first and foremost, but frankly also the health and safety of our entire community. Um, you know, I, I don't see how we can responsibly continue to have that trip move forward. Um, I think there are some other trips that probably require some decision making soon, and I know Dr. Palmer can certainly share with the board what the deadlines are for different trips in terms of, you know, what percentage of dollars can be refunded um, and those types of issues. Um, many of the trips do allow for a significant amount of recovery of funds. Most of the trips don't allow for a full recovery of funds. Um, but I certainly want to open this up for discussion. If we do want to move forward with taking action, um, then I suggest that we schedule a board meeting uh, for later this week to, to do that. So just to clarify, uh, it, any action will be done at the board meeting later in the week? Correct. We won't vote on, on anything this evening. Okay, so, so what we're in, in the discussion, we're basically needing to decide, are we coming back to make a decision? Um, do we do enough of this feel that we can't? We need to make a decision and not just say they go and us continue. Which right. Yeah, I think that um, the purpose in not voting tonight is, I think, you know, obviously this impacts a lot of people, and I want to make sure that people have an opportunity to, like, if the board has particular thoughts and perhaps intentions about what we might do, I want to give people the opportunity to to weigh in on that and and attend that board meeting. Um, if they would like. This is a kind of jurisdictional slash procedural question. I mean, I know that we had to approve the trip to begin with, um, but is it the administration's call as a first matter to cancel it, and then do we are we being asked to approve the cancellation? Like, what are we actually, what's our responsibility? Dr. Palmer. Because the board does approve the trip, it would be unusual for me to just go against what the board has already approved. It's different when the entity, such as the French exchange trip, canceled on us. We didn't cancel on them. But I can make a recommendation to the board based on safety if I would like you to cancel it. But you've approved this trip and it's ready to go. We've already collected money for it. Students and parents have the expectation that they're going. 
So it's more of a visual. I mean, we, we're not compelling the trip. We didn't require the trip to happen. No, but you've authorized the trip to go. Right. I would be going against the board's motion. Well, we've authorized it. We haven't compelled it. I mean, True. we've said, yes, they can go. So I'm just trying to figure out. Right. We And, and to that end, we did have one trip, or actually two trips that were approved. We had one to China and one to Peru that the board approved, but it was not running because of lack of interest. Here, these were already money was already collected for them. Right. I get, I get that. It's just. I, yeah, I think you're probably right in the sense that, like, perhaps it doesn't require formal board action. I think that it involves um, a lot of members of our school community. And, Absolutely yeah. great to be on the same page. You know, yeah. good to have another meeting, let people be heard, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to be clear about what, you know, the board's role in our quote unquote authority is. Um, okay, so actually. I think that because the board um, created this trip, essentially, and that it would be up to the board to decide to remove this opportunity, it's not up to the administration to unilaterally make the decision to simply cancel it. So um, in that respect, the jurisdiction is the board's. The board has the authority. The board is the one that's going to make this decision, not the administration get the enviable job of having to vote on the two most popular things in the universe. One would be canceling trips and the other's going to be the sleep and start times uh, change, but uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I think we need to, I think we do need to come back and, and have a, a voting decision on this. And yeah, I wasn't suggesting that we yeah. didn't. I just wanted to be clear about this. So, so I'm going to agree that we need to have that meeting, but I'm also going to state that it's, there are 500 school districts in the state of Pennsylvania and there are 50 states in the union and it seems a little bit ridiculous that this level of a decision is falling to school boards. That I think it should be coming from a Department of Health at some level, but it's not. So we will meet yeah. later this week to talk about this. Yeah. I, I just had one quick question. Is there another advantage to canceling the first trip, the most pressing trip to Orlando, Florida? I can see that there is a um, certain amount of refund up to 48 hours, but is there another advantage to canceling it um, closer in time, such as logistics or planning for the school? So is, is there a reason to do that um, closer in time that I, maybe that I'm not aware of? Earlier this week, uh, Henry Perberg, Nick Pinatero, and I got on the phone with the travel agent. There's no advantage. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, one follow-up. Is there a way, not that it would be dispositive, but is there a way to also, unless we've already done this, um, make sure that uh, the band knows that they're the most pressing trip and to get some feedback from those parents? Perhaps that's... Uh, I mean, not just one email, but you know, so they collectively know, and do they already? Actually, I'm going to impose on Nick because okay. he is here. He wrote a, a full email to the parents last week so that they knew the board would be discussing it this evening and that we were, of and I was system. having okay, significant concerns with it. But I thought, Nick, from your point of view, I don't know if you're getting a tremendous amount of feedback. I did get some feedback. Um, yeah. Can you go to the microphone? Sure. And sorry to put you on the spot, no, but I thought it, it's helpful if the board's going to make a Thank decision. You. Sure. Um, my, I'm Nick Pinatar. I'm the band and orchestra director at the high school. Uh, yeah, we, the parents and families and anyone who gets emails uh, for these on, for those going on the trip um, got an email from me earlier, I guess it was Friday, um, explaining that we were consider uh, the district was looking at the safety measures that the, that the government was talking about and also what we would do, um, and just let them know that we're going on as planned, but there is the possibility that the trip could cancel based based on safety uh, b safety concerns. Um, we have 230-ish families that are attending the trip, or student or fa fa separate families with students going. Um, I have heard from five formal uh, families, and I know that Dr. Palmer has heard from two. And the general consensus of those five is that uh, there's a concern rather than I hope we go. So the, the, the five families, and it's only five out of 200 and something, um, are concerned that, um, it, you know, about safety more than, than actually going. But, and they also pass along to whoever has to make the decision that, uh, they, that they're very sorry that the decision has to be made. <laughs> Thank, that's really helpful. Thank you. Dr. Palmer. 
one thing I would like to say to the board, um, Dr. Grandy has heard this, but all the rest of you have not, and Nick has heard this, and Henry Proberg has heard it. When I'm looking at all of these trips, I really do want the kids to go. My children had taken field trips. I accompanied them. I really want the trip to go, but I have to weigh the public safety aspect. In the case of Orlando, the scenario I had asked the travel agent on the phone was, we may be able to get all of our children and our chaperones, who are parents, and our teachers, who are also chaperones, on the trip, and they're fine. They get to Florida. They get stuck in Florida because something erupts in Florida. Do you even have hotel rooms for 14 days for this many people if I get them there and can't get them back? That's one scenario. The other scenario, we get them there, they have a great time. They come back and they get sick after they're back and they're in our school. There are 1,200 children at that point and all of the families. This is not a casual decision. And every day as I'm seeing more and more health threats coming closer to our area, I'm losing more sleep over this. But genuinely, I would love them to go. That's one side, but I can't get past the health risk. And can I get them back? And can I get them back into the school safely? without having a bigger issue than just the 230 students. That's a huge number and a huge risk. So when you had asked, does it make a difference to cancel earlier or later, we didn't bring it to the board tonight. We wanted to have more time to learn more about the progress, but also to have the board have an opportunity to think about it. But that's just one of the things I'm thinking about when I look at the Orlando trip. I have different thoughts when I'm looking at the international trips, but that's what's going through my head on Orlando, and it's not a casual thought process. Damon? This is one of those decisions where we're gonna have people upset no matter what decision we make. And I'm, not happy to make a decision, but I'm more than happy to be to, to have to to make the decision. Uh, and I think when we come back to a, another uh, uh, board meeting and make this to talk about this, I it will be a tough decision, and we will be getting emails beforehand and after. And I do hope we, we do hear from people before. Uh, and some people won't be happy, but. Uh, when this first started, I, I thought, oh, this is just going to be like SARS, which is also a, a type of coronavirus. And with SARS, nothing came about. But we had a very different public health response to that. And this is becoming something else. It's definitely some of, <clears throat> when we come back and talk about it, we, we do, I we think I'd like to hear from people to email at board at WSSD.org. I know plenty of people have that email. Uh, but I, no, but seriously, we'd like to hear, because you know, it's like if we only hear all the people that are negative, or only hear people that are super positive, that is not a good cross-section. If, 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 if you are thinking, well, I think it's probably okay, but I'm not sure, that's still an opinion we want to hear, because that is, is a valid opinion, too. So uh, when we do have the next meeting, which would be soon. It's not going to be like something waiting for a couple of weeks. I hope no. <laughs> I, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're right. yes. So I would suggest that we reconvene, <coughs> excuse me, reconvene on Thursday evening uh, to hold another board meeting. I think that gives a few days for people to weigh in, uh, but at the same time doesn't leave families hanging until next week to figure out what's going on. Uh, think I'd like a mic, but I don't. <laughs> so just an FYI, I just want to give you my two cents, because you know I do that. Um, I work in a continuing care retirement community. I'm on those same daily calls about this issue. And it is right now, it's all about social distancing. And I know you hate me, but um, <laughs> I have two seniors who are going to go on this trip, and they will be miserable if they don't go, but I can't afford my daughter. I'm an older parent. She's petrified that I'm going to get sick, um, that she's going to get sick and she's going to make me sick. And she's like, Mama, I don't want you to get it. And I'm like, I won't because, but I'm working in that risky population. 
of older, about 560 older uh, every day, older adults every day. So I just want to go on record because I may not make this next meeting because I know the trip's about 10 days away, that I'm one of those parents who haven't contacted you yet, that I really don't think this trip should happen because I know how those teenagers are. I know how they are when they're on a trip. They're not going to stand six feet apart. <laughs> and they're going to NASA, and they're going to play at Universal, and they're going to be on planes, and they're not going to wipe down the trays. You know, so I just wanted to let you know I, I think you're looking at it the right way, and I hope you cancel. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's plan on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. to convene. I think that um, we have to go through this list and, and make sure we understand each and every trip's um, timeline in terms of decision making. I do know that the high school's trip to Germany has some financial obligations that are imminent. Um, and so that may have some urgency to it. And I think that there is perhaps a couple other um, elementary trips that may, or at least one elementary trip that may be implicated. So um, we have to spend a, a little bit of time going through each and every one. Um, but I, I, the intent here is for the community to know that we are going to seriously look at some cancellations on Thursday. So with that, is there any other new business? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, Jen, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I am, in addition to being a school board member, the PSBA liaison, and I would like to bring to all of our attentions that our section, uh, which is Section 8, has a um, local event coming up on March 30th of this year from 6 to 8 at East Penn School District. And then again on April 7th, they're, uh, that would be redundant. They're both the same type of meeting from 6 to 8 at Haverford Middle School in Havertown, and uh, we are all encouraged to attend if possible. If you have more information about what they're going to cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, unless we're encouraging people right. not to attend I mean, the meeting, so stay tuned. Corona, yeah. corona permitting. But yeah. um, if you want more information about what they're going to cover at the uh, individual sections, you should contact PSBA directly. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Any other new business? Marilyn? I guess I, I, on that same vein, um, Jen, do you know if there's a, an opportunity to participate electronically? I do not think at this time that they're doing electronically, but as we know, uh, with the rapid change of everything, it is possible these may not happen or they may Correct. go to doing them electronically. I can verify that. Um, you would think they probably would be doing it. I, I don't think so, okay. but I'll, I'll verify the answer to that question. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Marilyn. All right. Any other new business? All right, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>